This question is titled, how do I isolate system state, specifically file system state? Because we talked about how the file system can be an isolation mechanism. You know, for each project that you work on, you have a directory. And in that directory, you might have a very similar structure that mirrors you know, each, each other. And you could say, oh, all the things in this directory don't really affect the stuff in this other directory, or things in the root directory apply to anything deeper. It's a very common approach. Here, I want to show you my one of my favorite command line tools, a tool that I don't know why nobody seems to know about. It is one of the most exciting and interesting and powerful tools, despite being incredibly simple. It's called BRAP and it works with something called Linux namespaces. In this question, we'll specifically talk about mount namespaces and we'll briefly touch upon other namespaces, but it's actually even more powerful than what I'm gonna show you. Let me give you a sense for what we're going to do. So why don't we get started with this question? It's often the case that as part of some script that you deploy, you need to write to disk. And anytime you interact with a physical artifact, like a file on disk, there is a huge risk of, it worked on my computer, but it didn't work on your computer. Oh, the directory that I was writing to didn't exist. Oops, I forgot to do a makedir. Oh, the directory that I was writing to did exist, and the makedir failed because I forgot to give it the flag that says it's okay if the thing already exists. Oops. Oh, the directory exists, but I hard-coded the home directory path, and you have a different username. Oh, uh, I put it in the temp directory, but somebody else was running the script at the same time, and my directory and their directory collide with each other. And when that happens, what are you gonna do? Well, typically you might use something like temp file module from the Python standard library. You can see this creates a temporary directory with a name temporary file in that directory. This temporary directory exists within this context and then gets deleted afterwards. And I can customize what these are called so I can clean them up nicely. I can customize whether they get automatically deleted, but that's something that I would do. I create a temporary directory with a temporary file and that way people don't clobber each other. People don't scramble to try and figure out how why, why their script is failing. Oh, it used a temporary directory, but it used only one temporary directory per, that was hard-coded. And so two people running it simultaneously run into each other. The thing is, even working with that temporary file system is problematic because what if you're out of memory? What if you're out of disk space? What if you don't have permissions? Anytime you have to write a physical artifact to the file system, it is problematic. And really think about all the places when you write these physical artifacts to the file system. Let's say you have a config file for your deep learning framework. Do you hand write that? Well, maybe you have multiple config files for multiple different environments or for multiple different projects and you templated them with Jinja and you run it through some templating process to generate these. Well, that's creating a physical artifact. You start with the raw data, the inputs of that template, and then you generate some physical artifact, the actual .conf file. Oftentimes you use tools like Make or simple shell scripts to do this. I do this all the time because when you look at some of the tooling around Docker, like Docker files and things like Docker Compose, they really anticipate you having this one static thing, a Docker file, a Docker Compose YAML file, but there's really no programmatic access. There's really only interpolation of shell variables, but there's often enough commonality, and I'm often working on so many different projects at the same time. What I want to do is have some template that then generates those. But the generation of those files itself could be problematic because what if I forget to generate it? Anytime you worked with make and you did like make clean, make clean, make clean. Wait, do I have to make clean before I make? Do I really have to do that? And you had that, that sense of it's good to stay clean before I do anything. Well, probably do that because you had been bitten by this core fundamental problem with physical artifacts on disk. You're never really sure what the state of things are. You're not sure if the file exists because it was created successfully or if the file exists because it was created but that failed after the file was created and make can't tell the difference. You're never sure. So you make clean aggressively and obsessively because you want to rewind to a known state. This is an isolation problem. Well, the Linux kernel provides you with the ability to isolate kernel level resources. Things like the file system can actually be isolated on a per process basis. Things like what processes exist can be isolated on a per process basis. And one thing that I'm curious, if you thought anytime I do PS tree, how come it only shows the Z shell process? I'm clearly running a bunch of other stuff like my code editor. What's going on there? Well, I'm actually isolating my auto runner within a process namespace where it can't see the other processes that are running on my computer. 
I can isolate network level resources. I can isolate inter, inter process communication level resources. I can isolate the host name and the domain name. I can isolate the users that exist. I can isolate things called control groups. I can isolate what time the computer thinks it is. Let me show you what BRAP is, and I'll show you first specifically in terms of isolating mount namespaces, isolating the file system. Here's the BRAP process. And uh-oh, it blew up on me. Unexpected capabilities, but not set you idea, caps file. Okay, here's what BRAP does. BRAP takes some command that you want to run, and it launches it, kind of like env. But where env launches it with amendments to the environmental variables, like you set the path or the Python path to the Python home, BRAP makes changes to the namespaces in which you run. And so here's a BRAP configuration that should work. Here, I'm going to read only bind my root directory, and then I'm going to run tree. And let me double check that my BRAP is running properly. I might have to edit one small thing just to get this to run. Let's remove these capabilities and go back to where we were. Because as you know, for these presentations, my setup is quite sophisticated. Well, here you can see, oh, that looks, just like, I, that looks like my root directory normally. Well, in addition to mounting the existing root directory, I can mount modifications of that root directory. For example, I could find everything in my etc directory, which is a lot of configuration that is used at the system level to determine things like how my DNS lookup works, what my known host names are, what configuration is picked up by all sorts of different parts of the system. I could create an RO bind option for everything in that directory. And I could bind, you know, I could change to the root directory, I could bind my dev, my dev pseudo file system, my proc pseudo file system, create a temporary folder for my etc and bind that. And then you can see, okay, I just got, you know, basically a mirror of my home directory. But I can also, in this temporary mounted file system that does not create physical artifacts, dead stop. This is a temporary file system that no longer exists once this process is completed. There is no explicit cleanup. It's like that context manager it cleans up after you automatically. I can mount synthetic things. And this allows an enormous amount of incredibly sophisticated but very simple tools. Why don't I put into this BRAP mount namespace everything but my etc host file? And for those of you who are Windows users, you know this. This is like your System32 host file. For those of you who are Linux users or Mac OS users, this is the file that gives you mappings of hard-coded IP addresses. This domain name hard codes to this IP address. I could mount everything but my etc host file. And then I could mount a synthetic script-generated etc host file that says example.com, .net, .org, .biz, and .info all map to 127.0.0.1. And when I do that, I have a slightly more complex BRAP example that looks like this. But when I ping example.com, let's get this going. Or let's ping our example.info. Ah, there we go. So I think our .com, let's make sure, I wonder why our .com didn't pick up. But when we ping our example.info, what you'll see is it actually pings our 127001. It used the ETC hosts that it saw that usually is a sysadmin sudo required to edit file. No, I just created a synthetic environment in which I can create any file of any form I want. And every other piece of my, my, my computing system, which is largely all of them on a, a well-designed you know, user space in Linux, which is all of them, will pick that up and work exactly the way I expect it to work. This is incredibly powerful because what it means is I can create file systems that do not actually exist outside of the scope of my script, which means instead of saying, oh, it worked on my computer with this particular file system, but I have to do all this programmatic stuff to discover what's your home directory or whatnot, I could just create a file system, hard code all the paths in that file system, and it's guaranteed to work as long as you have BRAP. I can do some even more sophisticated things. What's, let's say I wanted to distribute to you a couple of files, maybe some data and some code. Well, I could send you three files in an email, or I could send you a single shell script. And that single shell script could include inside of it the data file, and inside of it the code file. And with my BRAP command, I could tell BRAP, create a file called data.txt. And it's not going to create anything real. It won't be visible. The moment this thing terminates, that thing is gone. 
data.txt and code.py from these variables in my shell script. And so here I have a shell script that packages two files that do not exist separately and do not exist outside of the scope of this script itself. And yet it works. And shockingly enough, as you saw, this is running within a BRAP, within a BRAP, within a BRAP. There are so many layers here and it just works. I can do this very complex deployment, one shell script that packages everything that it needs, creates it and creates its own clean universe. And I can isolate this in a way where I don't have to scratch my head and say, oh, you know, how do I look up the right thing with the right directory or how do I make sure that I make this parameterized or whatnot? No, just create your own universe and hard code the paths and it just works. It is such a powerful tool, but there is more that BRAP can do. BRAP can set environmental variables. Well, that's not too fancy. I mean, N can do that as well. BRAP can unshare your Unix time sharing system, can unshare things like your host name. So BRAP can make your host name look like something else. Now, obviously, BRAP is very well aware. It's a, user, it's a user space program. It's very well aware of the security considerations that you have on a Linux system. It cannot do anything that you otherwise couldn't do as a regular user. It runs completely as a regular user, doesn't require any elevated privileges, and yet, you can still do some very sophisticated things that otherwise require elevated privileges. I can't change my host name without elevated privileges, but I can create an environment in which the host name is different with just the ability to create these namespaces, which does not generally require significantly elevated privileges. So I can actually do this safely and say, oh, don't sudo this. Who knows what that, what that does? Who knows what that means? I could isolate these things. I could change my UID and if I change my UID, oh, this is my favorite part. If I change my UID to user ID 1234 and my group ID 1234, and then I try and ask what's my name and what's my group, they don't exist because they don't exist in the ETC password file. So I could create a synthetic ETC password file and a synthetic ETC group. I could create users that don't exist on the outside system that only exist within the BRAP that have hard-coded UIDs and GIDs. Ah, I could even do things like this. I can tell the BRAP, when you terminate, kill everything that you spawned. Because generally, what you'll see is when a process spawns a child process and the parent term is terminated, the child gets reparented. The child doesn't get terminated automatically. It gets reparented all the way up to PID1. And so here, you can see my BRAP is running sleep five uh, and it's set to die with parent. If I kill that sleep, you can see everything died, the BRAP died and the sleep died. And if I don't do that, you'll see the typical behavior, which is if I kill the BRAP, the thing that it spawned, the sleep is still alive. So I can run packages, I can run collections of processes or child processes, terminate the BRAP and it terminates everything under that. That's also very powerful. Now, of course you can do that, you know, very simply there are certain, uh, there are certain signals that you can send to kill with the parent. There's ways you can start processes so they automatically die if their parent dies. But BRAP does it all for you, all in one package. And there is more. Let's say I run a program that I don't really trust. Like say, I don't know, Zoom. And let's say I don't want it to see my home directory because who knows what they're gonna do if they see my home directory. Launch it in a BRAP and give it a fake home directory. Let's say, I run a program like Firefox or Chrome that has very complex configuration. And I want to be able to copy that configuration to many different machines. Well, maybe I could run it in a BRAP and I could have a specific folder in my config directory which has that configuration and then I can copy that configuration over. Now there's one thing that I'm missing to make this work that we will talk about, but you can begin to see what a powerful tool it is. Despite being so simple, all it does is set environmental variables give you the ability to enter namespaces and create namespaces for a single command. It's kind of like the idea of environmental variables by themselves, that penv idea, but taken to the next level. And it is a supremely useful way to isolate because it does not require any sort of system level privileges beyond the bare minimum privileges to create namespaces, which is generally a given for us. Doesn't require anything that's set UID, doesn't require you to do anything. You can just build BRAP and a machine that you know, you don't have root access on and run with it. And so you can think the power that this gives you to write code that you can give to somebody else that works on everybody's machine because it creates the same universe, the same environment on everybody's machine, well, that changes the game. And the ability to have dependent files, like a file that creates a file that creates a file without any physical artifacts on disk, 
But instead, you have the BRAP as part of starting the process create those physical artifacts. So they only exist for the duration of the running process. So you never have to wonder, oh, did this get regenerated or not? Did this accidentally get checked into version control? Is this old? Is this stale or whatnot? Just create it one microsecond before you start the process and have it automatically cleaned up the moment the process terminates. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs>